Imagine it's 1983. You are in charge of Seiko and you have the watch industry in a firm grip. Technology is exploding and digital and quartz watches are on the crest of this cutting edge wave. It's been a decade after you started the quartz revolution and you have just done it again by introducing the world's first quartz chronograph. What's needed is a new icon. But how do you do that? How do you make something sexy, uh, something a bit different, unconventional, uh, something new, cool? Well, you create something like this. now and you also get free with your paid subscription the time machine a distinctive desktop digital clock and perpetual calendar with liquid crystal readout and quartz movement accuracy before seiko became the horological world superpower and before it changed the world forever in 1969 with the introduction of quartz watches it was far from the brand it was today despite its chronometer trial beating accuracy as it competed with the then dominant Swiss in the 1960s, their designs were always seen, even by themselves, as a little safe, restrained, conservative, and dare I say, a little dry. The result was a watchmaker that had little success internationally. But their 1969 quartz revolution started to change that, along with more vibrant, affordable, traditional mechanical watches like the Seiko 5 line. However, in the backs of minds of those in the upper echelons in the Seiko Corporation, the concern and fear of being seen as overly traditional in a culture that is obsessed with tradition would never cease. No matter how many exciting new digital complications, quirky TV watches and early wearable technologies they came up with. In 1983, Seiko unleashed another world first, the 7A28, which was the first quartz chronograph. Not only was it far more accurate and reliable than anything the Swiss had to offer, rather than a modular disposable plastic movement, astonishingly, the 7A series had a proper quasi-decorated 15 joule metal movement that could be regulated, disassembled, serviced, and even repaired. This explains why, despite often an impressive amount of abuse, so many have survived. But it wasn't just tough and built to last. It was deadly precise in recording time. The center seconds ticks off the seconds one at a time while the one tenth of a second dial zips around. In fact, it's moving at one twentieth second intervals. The minutes total up at the nine o'clock subdial and there's a running seconds at the six o'clock. This level of timekeeping caught the eyes of the top brass at the British Ministry of Defense. They were looking to issue more affordable and precise chronographs to their top elite Air Force pilots, and so they chose Seiko in 1984. Seiko created a sandblasted super utilitarian version, and quite incredibly, it would be issued until the early 1990s. Best Faruga, <laughs> vodka, rather shaken. But despite James Bond, then played by Roger Moore, now wearing the civilian version in the 1985 A View to a Kill, Seiko still needed something with a bit more pizzazz. What was required was something that would shake off those old fears of being too boring or conventional and really capture this new dynamic age. And after all, even James Bond, Sir Roger, was getting on a bit by this stage. So Seiko asked Giorgetto Giugiaro to imagine a collection of new watches for young motorcyclists and car drivers. By the early 1980s, Giugiaro had already established and proven himself as the greatest automobile designer of the 20th century. There's hardly any Italian car companies that he has not designed for. But not only supercars, his genius extended to Nikon cameras, motorcycles, guns for Beretta, office furniture, even a new type of pasta, and naturally, watches too. Born in Piemonte, Italy, 
Giugiaro's influence on the design world would come to define an entire age of automobiles. Just look at the DeLorean in Back to the Future and you will immediately see what I mean. One major benefit of Seiko's new quartz movements was that they were thinner compared to their mechanical counterparts, thus allowing more freedom in the design. But Giugiaro was not a watch designer, he was an industrial designer. This remarkably different approach meant he would start from the ergonomics outside and work his way in, rather than the opposite like a traditional watchmaker. Industrial design studies function and form primarily, the direct connection between the product, its user and environment. Giugiaro initially designed four models and then that soon expanded with different color variations of each. Now in motor racing, every split second counts. So operation had to be intrinsically quick, efficient and easy to use. There was one with an adjustable strap to convert the watch into a professional instrument that could be fitted on a bicycle handlebar or even a car steering wheel spokes. Another had a casing offset in relation to the strap to ensure it does not interfere with the cuffs of the shirt or jacket. The digital model featured an angle display to ensure the watch can be read while driving without having to turn the wrist. This was by no means the first time a watch had included this. Vacheron Constantin had done something similar at the dawn of wristwatches, but this certainly was the first time a digital watch had featured this design. Another had an asymmetrical pusher structure to make the watch easier to operate with gloves on, and even when the hand wearing the watch was on the steering wheel. They were all infused with Giugiaro's trademark futuristic retro style. Angular, brutalist shapes in a matte, subdued finish, bold, clean lines, and then vivid 80s bright colors to highlight hands or features needed to be extra legible. Giugiaro even went so far as to remove any luminescence from the analog versions. And while it is annoying for some, why did he do this? Well, most racing car drivers, with the exception of those racing at Le Mans, didn't race at night. So in an age before tinted loom was possible, it would be more readable with bright markers in daylight. Sometimes good design is also about what you take away from a watch as much as what you add di funzionalità e di capacità di, man di avere più spazio, più facilmente entrare e uscire, quindi l'ergonomia. Quindi mettevo un po' a rischio il mio modo di vedere l'estetica. Almost instantly, the Speedmaster collection became a hit. So much so, it was the choice of a then relatively unknown but a rising star in motor racing, a Brazilian named Ayrton Senna that was just making his debut in Formula One racing in the early 80s. Before becoming one of the greatest racing car drivers of all time, and before he famously wore a Tag Heuer, he was wearing a Seiko Speedmaster. This was real world proof of a watch doing precisely what it was intended to do, but not by sponsorship, but by the choice of the wearer. Get away from her, you Then in 1986, the notoriously fastidious film director James Cameron chose several Seikos for his next Hollywood blockbuster in the Alien franchise. Set in the far future, this sci-fi epic stars Sigourney Weaver as Lieutenant Ellen Ripley, along with co-star Lance Henriksen as Bishop, and they both wore Seiko Speedmasters. This was brilliant watch casting as the signature Giugiaro style complemented the super utilitarian spaceship sets. This was not merely aesthetic, it was crucial and important as it needed to keep a consistent contrast with the bio-organic nightmarish aesthetic of H.R. Giger's xenomorph alien creature. This watch casting was by no means an accident. Cameron at the time wore the equally iconic Seiko H558 Arnie, the world's first Annie Digi chronograph diver with an alarm. Even in some deleted scenes, you can see some of the extras wearing this watch too. 
In 2015, during Giugiaro's last year at the acclaimed and highly influential Ital Design Studio, Seiko celebrated the 30th anniversary of this collaboration with the legendary designer and reissued several of the originals with sleeker, more affordable, modern incarnations based on the newer 7T12 movements. Along with these reworked classics, there were also some stunning new creations. However, they did not quite have the same cinematic magic and racing history as the lovable 80s-based collection did. Today, Seiko continues to release new color combinations rather unceremoniously, and you can find them for an absolute steal. It remains one of the greatest sweet spots and overlooked iconic watches from Seiko, and I predict they will become even more desired as new or good examples of these limited editions start to become more scarce. So now you can own one of these for not very much, a very reasonable price on eBay. But what is important is, and I stress we do band about the word iconic a lot when it comes to watches, but this watch is, or watches I should say, in so many ways iconic. It was designed by one of the most uh, greatest car designers of all time, worn by motor racing legend, immortalized in Hollywood history, um, so good that its ancestors were uh, issued to RAF pilots, and of course it contained horologically significant Japanese technology. Not many watches can boast all of these claims. Now don't forget to like this video, click on the bell for notifications, so you don't miss out on new content and share your thoughts in the comments. I know this watch is intrinsically very 80s in its style and has something of a Marmite effect, but please do let me know what you think down in the comments, which is your favorite of Giugiaro's designs and what do you think of the newer designs? Thank you so much for watching and as always guys, I will catch you in the next one. Okay, ciao. Game over, man. Game over.